Let's talk about Bohr models and valence electrons. Get out your science notebook. Here's the essential question. How do we draw Bohr models to determine the number of valence electrons? Well, before we answer that, let's review what we know about atoms so far. Here is the atom and its subatomic particles. You should know that atoms are made of protons in the nucleus. The protons, being a subatomic particle, are part of an atom's identity. They provide the atom positive charge, and being in the nucleus, they contribute to an atom's overall mass. Neutrons are also in the nucleus, and their responsibility is to stabilize the nucleus. They act like glue to hold those protons together in that nucleus. Now, they do not have a charge, neutrons being neutral, but they do contribute to the mass as part of the nucleus. The electrons surround the outside of the nucleus. They manipulate the charge of an atom. Technically, they provide negative charge, but they counteract a proton's positive charge. Now, electrons have very little mass, so little that we typically don't count it when we're talking about the overall mass of an atom. Now, in this unit, we're going to be talking a lot about electrons. They're very important. So let's continue. First, let's talk about Niels Bohr. When Niels Bohr saw this model of an atom, he wasn't too happy about it. He said, eh, this isn't really how it works. I mean, think about it. If you think about the atom, the center is positively charged. That's the protons and neutrons so that don't provide charge, where the protons provide positive charge. Surrounding is those negative electrons. Now, Niels Bohr said if this was all there was, those negative electrons would spiral into the nucleus because opposites attract, negative to positive, and the atom would cease to be because of it. So Niels Bohr, through a series of mathematics and other experiments, came up with a new model. This is called Bohr's model. Now let me tell you some of the key ideas that he figured out using his experiments and mathematical equations. He said that electrons have to stay in specific energy level orbits. So if you look here, our electron has to stay within these ringed areas. Well, that helps solve our problem that the electrons don't spiral into the nucleus. Electrons cannot exist anywhere but these specific energy levels. He said that electrons farther away from the nucleus have higher energy. So you can see here labeled the lowest energy is closest to the nucleus, and then the highest energy is away from the nucleus. The farther away you get, the higher the energy. He also stated that electrons can jump between, they can jump from one energy level to another, either by absorbing or releasing energy. So here's our low level electron. And notice that when that little squiggle line comes in, representing energy and hits the electron, it jumps to a higher energy level. Up in that higher energy level, it's able to go back down if it releases that energy. And that energy can be in the form of heat, can be in the form of light. There's a few ways to do that. Now, why is this important, or how does this apply? Bohr's model helps explain why certain elements emit colors in a flame test. Maybe you did a flame test in class. That's where we take certain substances, put them in fire, and see if they emit certain colors. Well, many elements emit certain frequencies of color, and that's because of their Bohr models. If you think about, if you look at hydrogen here, for example, this right here is called a discharge tube. It's filled with hydrogen gas, and when you zap it with electricity, it emits certain frequencies of light. You can see it very simplified down here. Well, each element emits specific spectrums of emitted light due to those electron jumps between energy levels. In fact, each element, being its own unique Bohr model, can un emit its own unique frequencies of emitted light. And this is really important for scientists, especially astronomers. Astronomers can look out into space, and if they see the light emitted by stellar objects, they can tell what those objects are made out of, what elements make up them, because each element emits their own fingerprint of frequency, and they can compare that to the finger fingerprints of known light here. Okay, so how do we draw a Bohr model? Well, I like to use this thing I call the board game method. <laughs> Do you get it? Niels Bohr? Uh, anyways, let's keep going. So here over on the right are the steps of the board game method. You might want to pause the video in order to write them down, but I'm going to keep going. All right, so here are the steps. We're going to go through each of these different steps. So let's go and draw the Bohr model of a carbon atom. Well, if you look back at the steps that you wrote down, the very first step says we need to write down or draw the nucleus. Well, in order to do that, we need to know information about our element, and that's found on the periodic table. So it's very important to have a periodic table in front of you if you don't have one. 
Well, here is a carbon atom. Carbon has six protons because of the atomic number of that element. Now, how about neutrons? Well, the mass of the element is 12, and six of that is protons, so the rest of it must be neutrons. So this carbon, being the normal, average, neutral carbon, is six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus. All right, if you look at the second rule, the second step for drawing Bohr models, we need to know how many energy levels there are. Well, carbon is in the second row of the periodic table, so carbon has two rings surrounding it, and electrons are going to go on both of those rings. But where do the electrons go? Well, that's where we need to look at the third step of drawing a Bohr model. What we're going to do is we're going to use the periodic table, and this is where the board game takes place. We're going to go through each square of the periodic table in each row to determine where the electrons are. So here's my little pawn for my game piece. Now, just as in Monopoly or any other board game, we always start at the first square. So we're going to use hydrogen being square one to help us build the Bohr model for carbon. And we're going to move our pawn through each level of this board game, through each level of the periodic table to determine where the electrons go. So let's move our pawn to the first square. When I do that, I'm going to draw an electron on the very first innermost lowest energy ring of the Bohr model of carbon. Now I'm going to move my pawn over to the second square in order. Notice that that's in the same row, so I'm going to draw another electron in that very first energy level of the Bohr model for carbon. All right, so where do we go next? Well, I haven't reached carbon yet, so I'm going to move my pawn to the next level and go to the third square, which is technically lithium, but we're just using it as a square. And I'm going to draw an electron here on the next energy level of my Bohr model because now I'm in the second row of the periodic table. I haven't reached carbon yet, so I'm going to continue to move my pawn. And every time I move my pawn, I'm going to continue to add an electron to that level or that ring of the Bohr model of what I'm making, in this case, carbon. Notice I even included an electron when I landed on carbon. Well, this is it. This is the Bohr model for carbon. We've, we're done and we've completed it. Now we know where the electrons go and which electrons have low energy and which electrons have high energy. All right, let's do a student practice. See if you can answer this question on your own. Pause the video and see if you could draw the Bohr model for magnesium. Magnesium is number 12 on the periodic table. Its location is important. Did you try it out yourself? Did you figure it out? Well, let's check your work. Here is the answer for the, for the Bohr model of magnesium. 12 protons, 12 neutrons in the nucleus, three rings because it's in the third row of the periodic table. And in each row, the first ring has two, the second ring has eight, and the third ring has two electrons. All right, let's talk about valence electrons. You might remember we talked about how the farther away from the nucleus electrons are, the more energy they have. Well, valence electrons are the electrons on the most outer ring of a given atom. And they're extremely important. They're the highest energy electrons. The reason they're important is because they're responsible for the chemical properties of elements. They're the reason certain elements react or bond with other elements. So we're going to pay close attention to them. In fact, we typically draw these special structures called electron dot structures to show not all of the electrons of an atom, but just the valence of those elements. So here, for example, is silicon. On the left, we might spend time showing where each and every electron is in each every energy level. But sometimes we just want to know how many high energy level electrons silicon has. So on the right, we're just going to draw dots around the symbol for silicon to show how many valence or highest energy electrons silicon has. Now here's a little tip when you're drawing electron dot structures. Sometimes students don't know where the, the actual dots go. Well, imagine that if you were drawing the electron dot structure for something, like radon, imagine that that symbol is in a box. Now electrons are going to go on each side of the box, and every time you draw them, it's good to draw them on opposite sides or fill in all four sides before repeating. And we only do two electrons per side of the box. Again, the box is imaginary. All right, see if you can try this yourself. Draw the electron dot structure for selenium. In order to do that, you need to know how many valence electrons selenium has. Pause the video, see if you can figure it out. All right, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. I hope you tried to try it yourself. 
Well, first, here's the Bohr model for selenium that might be useful. It's technically not what we wanted, but this does show us how many high-energy electrons there are. I outlined them in purple in this. Notice that for selenium, there are six valence electrons. Again, that's not all of selenium's electrons, just the high-energy level electrons. So this is the answer we're looking for, the electron dot structure for selenium. And that's the end of the notes. Good luck.